One of my favorite topics in mathematics is the quaternions. And what I'd like to do in this video is give you a brief introduction to the quaternions and show you how we do some calculations with the quaternions. That is, introduce you to their algebraic properties. Now, oftentimes in math, we have many different ways of viewing the same thing. And let me tell you about how I view the quaternions by reviewing the vector concept. Now, let's say we're working in two dimensions. We have the x-axis and the y-axis and we have some force acting on an object. Now let's say the force acts two units in the x direction, for example two newtons of force in the x direction, and one newton in the y direction. Now mathematically we oftentimes represent such a force by a vector, if I call that force f, and notationally we might say that f is equal to two in the first component because it acts two units in the x direction and one unit in the y direction. And here what we have is a, simply put, a two-dimensional vector. And more abstractly we might say that such mathematical objects live in the set R2. Just denoting that we have two components here, that's what the two stands for, and that each of these components is being drawn from the real numbers. That's all it is, quite simply. Now for the quaternions, as you may guess from the prefix quat, or quater, uh, we have four-dimensional objects that we're going to be working with. Now, such a four-dimensional object may look like this. One, two, three, four. And such an object, one, two, three, four, is going to be an example of a quaternion. So in terms of what these objects are, what these mathematical objects are, they're just four-dimensional vectors. Up here we have two-dimensional vectors living in R2. Here we have four-dimensional vectors living in the set called R4. Oftentimes in math, we have different ways of notating the same idea. That is, if I go back up to this force F, I wrote it as 2, 1, as an ordered pair. But in the physics setting, one could easily notate the same force F in the following way. 2 newtons times a unit x direction, which is often written as x hat, plus 1 newton times the unit y direction, y hat. And this is denoting the same thing, just writing it out as multiples of x hat and y hat, but it's still representing the same arrow, the same directed line segment. Now, in the same vein, quaternions can be thought of as this quadruple, as I have written here, 1, 2, 3, 4. Alternatively, we could write such a quaternion, 1, 2, 3, 4, in the following way. 1 plus 2i plus 3j plus 4k. And hopefully you can see the correspondence between these two ways of writing the quaternion. What's important here is that you keep the order the same, and that each component gets lined up with their correct position. That is, the 1 gets lined up here, the 2 here gets multiplied by an i when writing it in this way, the 3 gets multiplied by a j when writing it here, and the 4 here in the final component is going to get multiplied by a k when writing it like this. You're going to see that such a flexibility in our notation is going to prove quite useful when we talk about quaternion multiplication. Now, one may wonder, if we have two quaternions, how would we do some calculations with them? That is, if I have two quaternions, how do I add them? Or how do I multiply them? And to answer that question, let's return to our two-dimensional vectors. So I have f, same as I talked about before, 2, 1. And let's suppose I have another force, which I'll call g, which is 0 in the x direction and 1 in the y direction. So on the graph, I would draw it in like that. And the question now is how do I add f and g? So what is f plus g? Now a simple answer. And a very good answer is to combine the first components to form the new first component and to combine the second components to form the new second component. That is, the first component of f plus g is going to be 2 plus 0, which is equal to 2. And the new second component is going to be 1 plus 1, which is also equal to 2. Now on the graph, what you can do is imagine taking that vector and sliding it up here and then completing this parallelogram here. 
And then what you're going to do is you're going to draw in the diagonal of the parallelogram. And that should be the vector 2, 2, if we've drawn a parallelogram accurately. But this is how we add vectors. And it turns out for the quaternions, we're going to do the exact same thing. So I have my four-dimensional vector here, that 1, 2, 3, 4. And let me just make up another four-dimensional vector. Let's say 0, 1, 1, 0. How do I add them? Just combine the uh, components. So I have 1 plus 0, that's 1. Now I have 2 plus 1, that's 3. I have 3 plus 1, which is 4. And finally, I have 4 plus 0, which is 4. Simply put, that's how you add two quaternions. More abstractly, if I have some quaternion, which I'll call Q1, made up of A, B, C, and D, and I have another quaternion, Q2, which is made up of E, F, G, and H, the sum of the two quaternions, which I'll call Q1 plus Q2, is going to be given by A plus E in the first component, just adding A and E. And the second component is going to be B plus F. The third is going to be C plus G. And the last is going to be D plus H. As you can see, quite simple and quite analogous to the two-dimensional case. And I should emphasize that we can go back and forth between our notations. Instead of thinking of that quaternion as A, B, C, D, I could think of it as A plus B, I plus C, J plus D, K. And that other one I could think of as E plus F, I plus G, J plus H, K. And the resulting quaternion, after I sum those two, is going to be A plus E in the first component. And the second component is going to be B plus F all times I, keeping the I's together. Now keeping the J's together, it's going to create C plus G times J. And finally, keeping the K's together, I have D plus H times K. Just to emphasize that we can go back and forth between these two notations. Now, what makes the quaternions very interesting and also endows them with some very interesting properties is the way in which one multiplies two quaternions together. Now, what I could do is just give you the formula, but more importantly, I think, is to show you what the inside was that generates the formula. Because if you see what the inside is, you can generate the formula on your own. And half of the insight is to go back to what we know about the complex numbers or how we generate the complex numbers, which is that we have some object called i that has the property that i squared is equal to minus 1. Equivalently, i is one of the two square roots of minus 1. Now, what the quaternions do is not only have an i, but also a j and a k that also square to minus 1. So I have j squared is equal to minus 1 and k squared is equal to minus 1. So this is half the insight right here, to have three imaginary units that square to minus 1. Now the other half of the insight behind the quaternion multiplication is to have the three imaginary units multiply together in this way, that i times j times k is equal to minus 1. And these four equations are summarized as follows i squared is equal to j squared, which is equal to k squared, which is equal to i j k, which is equal to minus 1. And this is the famous equation that Hamilton came up with, the famous Irish mathematician. I believe this is a, a famous piece of graffiti uh, somewhere in Dublin. Uh, and this, this equation right here, especially this one, is going to generate all the rules that we're going to need to set up quaternion multiplication. Now, to actually generate the quaternionic multiplication, what I'm going to do is simply take this a plus bi plus cj plus dk and distribute it to e plus fi plus gj plus hk. And I've written that out down here, all 16 terms of that sum here. And this may look like a mess, but it's actually quite organized. What I did here in this first line is take the a and distribute it to each of the four terms. So I get ae plus afi, that's afi, then agj plus ahk. And then I take bi times e, then bfi squared, 
then B I G J, and so on. The thing you need to watch out for is when you have something like I times J, that you make sure you write it in the order I J, that you don't carelessly flip it around and write J I, because because it's going to turn out that the quaternion multiplication is not commutative. So this is what you get, and as you can see here, if I take for example I J. I need to know what I'm going to have to do with the ij. I need some rule for uh, what to substitute into ij. And to show you how I'm going to make all these substitutions, for example, the ij, ji, kj, and also the i squareds and j squareds, I'd like to generate the multiplication table for you. Or at minimum, I'd like to generate some of the multiplication table, but I'd like to show you how it's going to be done. What I'm going to do is go back to that equation, ijk is equal to minus 1. And what I'm going to do is multiply both sides by i. So I'm going to have i times i times jk is equal to minus i, just multiplying both sides on the left by i. And here I have i squared jk is equal to minus i. And remember what i squared was equal to, that was minus 1. So this equation implies minus jk is equal to minus i, which also implies that jk is equal to i. So from this equation alone, if I ever see jk in this sum here, and I actually have a jk right there, I'm allowed to replace the jk with an i. Now wh what I'm going to do is organize all these multiplication rules in the table like this. So the jk, I'm going to stick right here, j k, and I'm going to write i. And it turns out that I know three more positions in this table already. I know that i times i, or i squared, is equal to minus 1. Same thing for j times j, or j squared, that's also equal to minus 1. And k squared is also equal to minus 1. Now, to generate the other entries, what we're going to do is we're going to take this equation, we're going to multiply both sides by j, so I'm going to get j squared, times k is equal to ji. Now remember j squared is equal to minus 1, so I get minus k is equal to ji. So I'll just write that in the table here, ji is equal to minus k. And now let me take this equation and multiply it on the right by i. So I'm going to get minus ki equals minus or sorry, j i squared. So I get minus k i is equal to minus j, which implies that k i is equal to j. And I'll fill that in right here. k i is equal to j. Now I'll leave the remaining three entries right here, here, and here as an exercise for you. But what you're going to find is the very interesting property that, let's say I have j i is equal to minus k, then instead of looking at ji, if I look at ij, it's actually equal to the opposite of minus k, which is k. That is to say, when I commute each of the i's, j's, or k's, commuting them results in a sign flip. So I have ij is equal to k, but then when I flip the order, I have ji, that's equal to minus k. And if I go down here, I have ki is equal to j, and what you can prove is that i times k is equal to minus j. And finally, I have j k is equal to i. And if I flip the order, k times j, that's going to be equal to minus i. So this is the very interesting non-commutative structure of the quaternion multiplication. Since we have this multiplication table at our disposal, finishing this calculation is just a matter of making the right substitutions. Since we know what to do with, for example, the i squares, the ij, and the ik, we just look it up on the table and make the substitution. And let me do that for you right now. Here's what I get after I make all those substitutions. And you could probably notice that I have some sign flips coming in here. And the last step is to simply collect all of the like terms. That is, all of these terms, such as ae, minus bf, minus cg, and minus dh, are all going to get collected to form the new first component. The i's are going to be collected together. I have the i's there, 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 and there. 
then I collect the J's, and then I collect the K's all together. And let me do that for you right now. And here is the final product after combining together all the terms that have neither I's, J's, nor K's in them. That's this first line here. Combining together all the I's, that's the second line. Combining together all the J's, that's the third. And all the K's, the fourth line. Now it's important to note, uh, besides where this comes from, that quaternion multiplication is in general not commutative. That is to say, if I have Q1 and Q2, in general, that's not equal to Q2 times Q1. That's one of the interesting properties about quaternion multiplication. Even though the commutative law is false in the quaternions, the associative law remains true. That is to say, if I have three quaternions, let's say Q1, Q2, and Q3, I could multiply Q1 and Q2 first, then multiply on the right by Q3, or I could take Q2 and Q3, multiply those first, and then multiply on the left by Q1. So the associates of the law is going to be true. The last little piece of jargon that I'd like to point out is, let's say I have some quaternion, Q1, made up of A, B, C, and D. Oftentimes, this first part, this first component, the A, is called the scalar part. And the final three components, taken together as one three-dimensional vector, is called the vector part of a quaternion. Oftentimes we divide them like this for uh, specific applications in physics and also uh, computer graphics. And I think that'll do it for the fundamentals of quaternions. Of course, there's always much more to say about any mathematical topic. These quaternions very famously find application in those who create video games, who want to accurately model a rotation in three-dimensional space. And it's also very interesting to note that this is a problem that people struggled with in the 1800s, mathematicians and physicists. And it's interesting that in the year 2016, we find some application for these seemingly abstract mathematical objects. Perhaps we might say that the mathematical objects that we create in the year 2016 may find some application in uh, 2200 or 2100. Who knows? So I thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed this video or any of my other content, I highly encourage you to subscribe to my channel. Feel free to leave comments, including angry comments. Um, I'm always disappointed that I don't have too many angry comments. And uh, thanks again for watching.